Right. Got the Grandmaster Melly Mel up in here. Yeah. yeah. Turn Mel up, son. We gotta eat. I need that again. Give me that again. Right. Right. There uh, you go. Can't yeah. nobody do that in Raw like Melly Mel. You own that shit, baby. <laughs> yeah. If you ever a Raw on the record, you gotta pay Melly Mel. That's can't right. do that shit just Copy like that. See? <laughs> What's up, Mel? I can't call it, it's all good. You see what I'm saying? And introduce and yourselves, please. Me to Dale Harrison, represent New Orleans and BK. I'm going to be hosting the show on April 11th. Shout out to the Aquarius boys for bringing us. All, all right, right. All and, right. and, and the one and only? MC Debbie D from Us Girls. This Us Girls. See, Debbie wow. D is in the house, and Mr. Stephen Hager, the writer. The original hip hop journalist. The original hip hop journalist, the <laughs> writer of Beach Street. Yeah, I, 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 I gotta give him a round of applause on that. <laughs> Tell me how Beach Street, well, first of all, Beach Street Reunion is here in New York City, April 11th at B.B. King's, right in the heart of Times Square on 42nd Street. Yep. Tell me how Beach Street came about. Uh, well, uh, I guess uh, Fab Five introduced me to Bambada. Okay. And nobody knew anything about what was going on. And I was from Illinois. So I was like, oh, wow, look at these trains. They must paint these kids to do this. Who's ever is doing that? I thought it was Walt Disney was painting the trains. Okay. They were so good. <laughs> And, and so I came here to be a professional journalist, but I couldn't get anybody interested in this culture. And I was going, whoa, whoa, whoa something's going on here, because these people are inventing their own music, their own art, their own dance, their own style of talking, walking, thinking, everything is being reinvented by these kids. Mm -hmm. And nobody cares. No, in fact, they act like it's dumb and stupid, and they right. wish these people would go away. And so I was like, for years, I was the only journalist in America that cared, or, you know, eventually I tracked down Cool Herc and eventually I, I did uh, write a treatment which I took first to Jane Fonda and, and then I took it to Harry Belafonte mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, Harry, you know, had wanted to do it right, right, right away, he knew that. So I, I, I basically, I wrote a script that was the real deal. It had angel dust, it had, you know, pot, it had crack because crack really devastated the whole scene right so I told the story and I told it through the eyes of a young kid who was the son of one of the greatest black spades of all time named Solsky mm -hmm. who had been shot dead by the police in a shootout where he was unarmed you know this was at a time when it was unusual for black people to be shot by police now nobody would <laughs> what was that <laughs> <laughs> This is 1971. Okay. And 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 really, the Bronx went to shock when that happened. And uh -huh. it, it really affected Bambada, and I think it helped move the culture away because at that time it was very violent up there, mm -hmm. and and people got sick of it. And so so your your original Beat Street script is way different than what we saw. Oh, it's so different, but we it, need to do that one that you talking about. That, I, I, <laughs> but I want to I want to tell Mel exactly what the story was because. His son, uh, you know, I mean, his younger brother, Solsky's younger brother, survives and goes through this voyage of discovery where at the end he matures into a man and writes the message, which elevates hip hop to a, a higher level. Right. And that, that, mes that message song was originally written in Super Rappin', the original yes. record put out by, record by the, the Red Label. That I always had in my house. So I had right. this I had this dream, we were going to recreate the, the Hevalo, everything was going to be as it was, the real characters were going to be there to help us do it all, we were uh -huh. going to, and it was real. When and did it change? Who cha why did it change? Who changed it? Uh, Who said, fuck this script, we're going to do this little Well, shit. I'll tell you, this is a funny story. Right? Because, the, can the candy cause, store of her. Because <laughs> Harry Belafonte got surrounded by a bunch of guys from Brooklyn. And wow. slowly what I saw happening was they were telling him, like, oh, oh, us, us Brooklyn guys, we invented hip-hop. Please. And, and, and I, had brought no, phase, I, I had brought Phase 2 in, <laughs> and I brought, like, uh, you know, tried to, what I really wanted was a showdown between the Furious and the, and the, the Cold Crush Brothers. Because okay. at that time, that was the ultimate, that was absolutely ultimate show ultimate at that time. Show, huh? That and was on tape, that's everything, what we knew. Everything started to fall apart. You know, it's like Harry demanded that the Cold Crush do an audition, and they refused because they were above that. They were the biggest act. And right. the, the, the Furious had just broken up. And, and you know, everything started Mel, changing. Mel, how the hell you get involved in this movie? 
at, on the tail end, I guess they needed a song for the movie, and then we came and talked to Harry because uh, the son was supposed to write the God, uh, God, uh, whatever his name. He was supposed to write the song, so I, I had wrote the song for him. We weren't supposed to be in the movie. I wrote the song for him, the Beast Street Breakdown, and he was supposed to do the song, but he couldn't get the words. So they, they had my voice, and he lip synced to my voice in the first rhyme, and then we came out at the end of the movie and did the last part. But he just, you know, he just couldn't, uh, uh, you know, get everything the, the intricacies of the grand. Man. Why would you want yeah. anybody but Mel to do the rap anyway? I mean, Not it's like they don't want to pay as that. himself, and it's like right. no, that's how everything got twisted. It's like I can't tell you. It's like I sat down with Harry and all these people, and I said, "You must have Apache. You must have just begun." This is the magic. You must stay true to this. Right. And mm -hmm. suddenly it turns into this stuff where it's all about this kid who's got more equipment than Harry Belafonte. He's right. got like he's living in an apartment with like fifty thousand dollars worth of gear and stuff. And <laughs> nobody had any gear until after the blackout. You know what's crazy about this whole wow. conversation? <laughs> Y'all pretty much tell me Beach Street was bullshit. <laughs> and look, I, I wish I would have been telling me. The dancing saved it because we had the, uh, you know, we had Crazy Lakes and his crew. We had the, we had those kids were real. They were right. still. But this is what. But the story was not what it was supposed. No, to. and I'll tell you something about this whole culture that people don't understand. We're talking about kids that are 14, 13, 14, 15 years old. How old were you, Debbie D, when you got involved with the Oz girls? When we did the movie, I think we were like 21. Yeah, something. yeah. But you had been rapping a long time before oh God, that, right? 13. Like, we all kind of met at the T Connection, you know, or the PAL or whatever, Bronx River. We were like 13, mm. 14, 15 years old, the most. Wow. Now, if you look at what's happened with culture and where it all comes from, it starts in Congo Square, and there's only 500 people down there mm -hmm. involved, and only 50 of them are actually involved in the culture, like the, the people that are creating the shit. And then in the 20s, you get a second wave of 13, 14, 15-year-olds led by Louis Armstrong, mm -hmm. and then comes blast, uh, blues, jazz, rock and roll. You're way too far back from our audience. But I'm saying, but I'm saying... In the Bronx, same thing. You had 500 people. Only 50 of them were contributing. Right. And of those, only a few, like Mel, were at the top, top Mel's inspiring involved. people, you know? <laughs> but this is what I'm saying. Mel's still the world changed. It changed because of Congo Square. It changed because of Louis Armstrong. It changed because of South Bronx hip hop. Hip hop changed the world. Absolutely. And so the, I wouldn't be saying the kids, if it wasn't for the kids. Dude, Debbie D, what are you doing? How much money was the us girls making, if, if any? We didn't really make much. As a matter of fact, the funny thing is, just coming down here in this Rockefeller Center area, when I did Beach Street, I was working in a law firm here. Oh, wow. That's right. And my boss wasn't going to let me be in the movie until he spoke to Harry Belafonte and said that they had to create some contracts for us. And that's why we get paid right now. That's nice. 30 years later. That's nice. Wow. And Residuals. That's As a right. comedian, I'm making the same thing you was making in the 80s right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got, you, you got to start somewhere. When we got Raheem, we made Raheem off. He could refuse. Hey, you no, know, Mel, I always wanted to ask you this question. Uh, to me, you're a game changer when it comes to MCs. Like, there was a certain style of rapping that we were doing, which I call a call and response, yeah. mm -hmm. before, before you. Before you, we were, you know, put your hands in the air, say ho, and maybe a little bit of Superman and I had a fight. But it wasn't no real long rhymes with metaphors and assemblies and, and the things that you were doing. When did you first hear the message? Who produced the message? And why would, to you, in your opinion, we know that's one of the most impactful records in the history of all music. Yes. Why, to you, why is that record so impactful? Well, uh, uh, the, the, the producer of the record was Miss Sylvia Robson. That actually, the message was supposed to be for Sugar Hill Gang because we had a record out by then. Oh wow! They didn't want to do the record when we when I first listened to the original lyrics of the record that was written by Duke Booty. It was Ed, his name is Ed Fletcher, but he he's on the record with me, Duke right. Booty. So he wrote like the main body of it, and then uh, Miss Robson took the Child Is Born rhyme from Super Rap and put it on the end, and that's the main. That's so how you the main never body. did the record over. You never did the you never did the lyrics over. Uh, yeah, we did, I, I, I did what he wrote, like the beginning, broken yeah, glass yeah. everywhere and all yeah. that. I had to do that over. Okay. But he did like the second verse, the third verse, and the fourth verse. And then right. the Child is Born is, is the fifth verse. Right. So, uh, uh, but so I, they just took the Child is Born off Super Rap and put it on well, there? Well, I, no, I, I, yeah. I, okay, I, I, yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 I'm like, yeah, I mean, that sounds different. Yeah, yeah, because it was better produced, you know. And and after Miss Robinson, I mean, as far as female producers go, she's definitely the most prolific 
a female producer. Not only did she do the message, she did Rapper's Delight, and then she did all the moment stuff, Love on a Two Way Street, That's which right. they use on Empire State yeah. of Mind. So she's a very uh, you know, and, and, and her own and her own right. Yeah, and 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 she has a vision because the, her vision was what made uh, uh, hip hop what it was industry wise on record. Right. right. We we would have never thought about like when we heard Rapper's Delight, we thought it was the worst shit that we ever heard. Right. And then guys would come to yo, y'all should do a record like that. We was like, how are we going to do some right. shit like right. that? Right. <laughs> like you know, because we was yeah. rapping on. A, a different level. You so see what why, would, why do you feel like that record was so important? As important as it was, it changed hip hop. Well, you know, just just to, just to, uh, when it came out, and and then you know, just the the, the lyric, don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. That's bigger than that. That's anybody. Anybody could feel like that. You know, like you said, the corn responds ever. You know, that's the if you locked in the party thing, okay, you cool with that. But if you it, it stepped outside of that, you yes. know, they got in the social commentary how people feel. You know, the bill collector bring my phone scam right. wiping out. It, like it, you know, people that that don't have nothing to do with hip hop. They could relate to that record, and that's what made that. And to this day, I mean, it's the most important rap record. You know, every time they do a, a survey, it's the number one record. Yeah. And, and the top 500 records, it was number 51, the top 500 records ever recorded. Wow. Number 51. Up there, yeah. you, you know what I mean? So it, 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 it was bigger than hip hop. It was it was it was yeah. pop. It, 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 and it, it, it moved the genre of hip hop to another level. Definitely, it made it, it so that level. people could actually talk about. What was really going on, in a sense, what was really going on outside of just throw your hands in the air and we're going to party and I got a, you know, I got a big car sitting outside and I'm, it really, yeah, it made hip hop mean something. Before, yeah. before that, I mean, it, it was what we, it was what we wanted to do. After that, it was, it was, you know, it gave us something else to do and it, and it you know, brought about groups, you know, the public enemies and, right. and the KRS-1s. It brought about, you know, the X-Clans. It brought about a whole nother a, a genre of MC and, and, and a whole nother message that you could put out to the people that was other than partying. Yeah, absolutely. And Debbie D, when 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 you guys were, were starting to do to do your thing, when the us girls were coming out, how many different females were there? Oh, it wasn't that many of us. It was not that many of us. Um, again, I often say, you know, myself, Shalak and Lisa Lee, we are the matriarchs. A lot of times we don't get the credit. People don't say much about us or whatever. Right. But every girl that's basically on the mic after us is standing on our shoulders. Right. That's the truth. And we were back in the day when we were out there pushing the flyers, standing behind the rope saying, can we get on the mic? You know, um, passing records around and all of that kind of stuff. But it wasn't that many females around. You had the Mercedes ladies. Okay. You had Pebbly Pool. Who was, who was, who was the main, your, your main, uh, the battle? Who was it between? Us girls and who? Mercedes well, ladies? We, no, because we never battled. No? No, we never really battled. There wasn't nobody to battle. No, you know what? We just wasn't like that. We, you know, everybody was homegirls. Everybody mm -hmm. was doing their thing. I think the battles kind of came in that second wave. You know?